Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dean. It's apparent I have friends at Yale. <laughs> now, Thursday, maybe I should just stay here. I mean, on Thursday, I have to go back to Washington, where are, there are those who take a somewhat less elevated view of my character and competence. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you think you're going to get an answer to this question? I don't know why, but this introduction reminded me of an old story people used to tell of Lyndon Johnson during the Vietnam War. Uh, which was uh, not a happy event for our country. And during that time, he got into a fight with his speechwriter, and he had to give a speech. And he started reading from the cards that the speechwriter had prepared. And they said, now you may wonder how I'm going to reconcile our aims of bringing peace to Vietnam with my having sent 500,000 additional troops. You may wonder how I'm going to bring together our lofty objectives in the world with the terrible views that others are taking of us because of this incident. You may wonder how I am going to reconcile the terrible inflation the war has caused with my desire to have social projects that will make Americans better off. And he turns to the next card and it says, I quit, you're on your own, wise guy. <laughs> So there we are. <laughs> now it's true, yesterday I was starting with an idea, the idea is a simple one, that this Constitution was meant to be workable. That meant it isn't just words on paper, it's meant to work for people in the United States. And as part of that, part, the framers thought, or many of them, that it was a fairly good idea to give the Supreme Court the power to review the lawfulness of statutes measured against the Constitution. And it is also true that they didn't seem to ask the question of, well, if these people are so un, not, no purse, no sword, nobody's heard of them, uh, they're just these uh, bureaucrats that sit there and decide things and they'll try to be fair, that's about the most we can say for them, they will try to be fair and they won't disturb us too often, why would anyone on these major issues that they feel so unpopular, so terrible, so strongly and uh, maybe so wrongly decided they're all thinking about the court, my good Goodness, why will they ever do what the court says? And that was the question we asked. And then I gave some examples, which of course don't give an answer, but are meant to make you or others think about the problem and think that we've come in a certain sense a long way and we do have a treasure there. And so if you want to know how are we going to get people to continue to do this, I hate to tell you, it isn't going to have much to do with the court. It's going to have quite a lot to do with the same question I get in Europe, I was at some uh, event where they're celebrating the 200th anniversary of the French Civil Code, and one of the questions that comes up is one of the people there. The well, first question, actually, by the way, was he thought he said, I, I've, uh, uh, it's interesting, I've, I've uh, uh, learned that we uh, have uh, put into this Civil Code after 200 years uh, a lot of uh, provisions that are designed to give equality to women. So why is it in two, two days of, of many, many speeches praising the Civil Code, there hasn't been one woman who was invited to give the speech? Is that... And then he says the second question is, what do we do with the Civil Code now that we're in a world? And the third question, though, how do we teach the values in the Civil Code to our children and our grandchildren? Of course, my reaction, as in, where am I? Am I in the United States, in France, in Boston, in Paris? We have the same question everywhere. And that last one is the question. And the answer is going to be, we're going to have to find a way to do it. Because that's where the answer lies. It's not going to be in the court. But, <laughs> and it's a big but, the court has its responsibilities too. And maybe the court can help a little. Maybe. And that's what I want to talk about this afternoon. If the public generally has an obligation to follow, if we want to keep this treasure, then the court too has an obligation. Well, to do what? And here immediately we'll start into controversy. Because in my mind, what the court has the obligation to do is to make decisions that will work well for people. Interpret the law in ways that will work well for today's public. So already we're too abstract. Luckily, I have about 200 pages making this more concrete, but nonetheless, I won't tell you all those pages. Uh, abstract. Try to create decisions that work well for people. 
here in the United States. Hmm, what does that to do with yesterday? Well, if you do, they're more likely to think what you're doing is okay. And if they think what you're doing is okay, they may have more pride in the institution. And if they have more pride and confidence in the institution, then maybe uh, they'll tend to continue. What we said yesterday was a treasure in effect. Well, that's the connection. But let's go back to this very abstract phrase. Now, I can make it a little bit less abstract. I can say that if I want to describe this general approach, I would probably describe it as taking, in the Constitution at least, certain values that are permanent, that don't change, and applying them uh, to a world that changes continuously. And I say, okay, that sounds good enough, at least for 4th of July or something, but I mean, that's pretty abstract too. Well, let's try and make it a little more concrete. Uh, what about uh, saying that there really isn't an overall pragmatic approach to the Constitution? It isn't true, I don't think it's true, that anyone, or very few, would look at a decision, and then decision by decision, say, I want to see here which will be best, what will produce the best result. Well, that, that leaves out what you're going to law school for three years to learn. It's called law. Law is a very complex set of interrelated institutions. It involves some words in statutes, it involves a constitution, it involves a common law, it involves law firms, it involves hundreds of different institutions, all of which interact in some complex way. And if suddenly you have a judge coming in and just saying, oh, I'm just going to do whatever I think is good case by case, that is not going to work, in my opinion, very well. But still, but still, I think there are a set of pragmatic approaches that may help. Well, that's good because that's pretty vague too. So I can say what I'm doing this afternoon is giving you an introduction to a pragmatic, no, to an approach to a set of pragmatic approaches. And by the time you figure that out, the hour will be over and I won't have to say another word. All right, now, let me say what it isn't. Let me say, what, what, where, what is it? It means my looking back over 15 years of experience in the court and trying to ask myself the question, are the decisions that I've tended to make, is the view that I've tended to take towards different problems, is it really just ad hoc, one by one? Or can I characterize it? Does it fall into categories? And are there reasons why I think that these categories might be better rather than worse categories? That's what I've tried to do. And I think the answer is yes, I can. I can to a degree. And that's what I want to talk about. What isn't this approach? I can tell you what it isn't. For one thing, it is not whatever is signified by this word called originalism. What is originalism? Well, it's something tying back, and I don't want to characterize it because I don't follow it too much, and uh, therefore I don't want to be too mean to the people who do think it provides a terrific solution. And uh, there are good arguments for it. But uh, I don't find it very attractive as an approach, really, for a number of reasons. It's looking back uh, to seeing what would James Madison have said or what would uh, Alexander Hamilton have said, and I see nothing wrong with that if what you're trying to do is understand the basic value underlying this particular part of the Constitution. But when you get, want to get specific answers from Hamilton or from Madison or from their contemporaries, I find that difficult. I find it difficult, first of all, because the real cases that come up they didn't say too much about. I mean, we have a confrontation clause. The confrontation clause says that you have to confront witnesses. The accused person has to have an opportunity to confront witnesses. Well, that has something to do with Sir Walter Raleigh, oddly enough, who was convicted because they brought into court some statements made by witnesses out of court that had been signed, and when Sir Walter Raleigh says, bring them in, they say, oh, we're sorry, we lost them. We'll give you the statements, but we can't give you the people. So we know that this has something to do with that. But a case comes up and says, what about a woman who tells a policeman that her husband has been beating her up, and then three days later she's found dead, and the husband's put on trial? Can we admit that? or not? Does the Confrontation Clause forbid it or not? Because she's not there to be confronted anymore. She's been killed. Hmm. 
Let's ask Madison, he doesn't say. Can we ask Sir Walter Raleigh? He's gone. Not even Blackstone tells us the answer to that. And I've just given you an example because I think that the statement was well made by Justice Jackson. He says often, he says, that history is as enigmatic as Joseph's dream. That's good, I like that. Good phrase, and he had many good phrases, and that's one of his better ones. And I have to say subjectively, case after case after case, where I find that history pretty enigmatic. And if we want to decide on the basis of what Madison would have said about such a thing if anybody ever asked him and they never did, let's hire nine historians and not nine judges because the historians will fight. But it's at least possible they'll come closer to the right answer. But a more important reason, I think, as to why I find it so difficult to follow is because often the relevant thought of the framer is not really exactly how they would have decided this case. It's often what kind of a provision they were writing. And what I mean by that is if you see the word two senators in the Constitution, that doesn't mean three. It didn't mean three then. It didn't mean three now. And you can change the world as much as you like. It's never going to mean three. But when you see the words interstate commerce, you can't be certain. But you probably think that the framers intended the content of those words to change over time. They didn't know that we were going to have the internet or television. But they thought that these words will pick up. Now, fill in the blank. But we do know that the most that they could have thought of is the words will have different content as time progresses. And that's true of a lot of words in the Constitution. Did those who wrote the 14th Amendment, who saw segregated schools, and who didn't think, apparently, that this, these words are going to stop segregated schools, at least not now, ah, did they think, at least not now? And did they think that as time changes, if things don't work out, and we end up with the South that we ended up with in 1953, that now it will pick up segregated schools and stop them? I think that absolutely. I think that absolutely. And that's pretty universal. But note the nature of that intent. The intent was to serve a purpose, a certain kind of purpose. And when that purpose is not served, the content of what fills in the blank of what's forbidden or not changes in light of what the overall purpose was. Is this a provision that changes, or is it not a provision that changes? And often, they don't express a view on that any more than they expressed a view about whether originalism or something else would be the right way to interpret the Constitution. They said not a word about it. Then another reason that I don't particularly favor this particular approach is because often, it seems to me, it's not very transparent. That is, at least if you're uncertain, and at least if you see a lot of purposes going in different directions, and you see precedent going in different directions, and you see consequences that will come out one way or the other, and you want to write about those because you think you're relevant, you write about them. And a person reads that opinion, and he says, how wrong Breyer was, or sometimes how right. But he can least see exactly what I'm thinking. But if you're trying to write about what, say, a 19th century, early 19th century judge thought about what Blackstone, who's an 18th century writer, thought about what happened in the English Civil Wars in the 17th century, and the historians disagree, it's a little hard to know sometimes just what this judge is driving at. Is the ball being hidden or is it not? And all we can talk about is the history. And then a fourth reason, and now I'm coming to the main point, is if in fact, well, that were the Constitution. If, in fact, that is what we're supposed to do. If, in fact, it turns out that there was flogging in the Navy in 1780, and uh, that means that it's OK, not cruel and unusual punishment to flog people today. Or if, in a society that people hoped would evolve in 1865, just after the Civil War, they thought maybe there will be segregated schools for a while, 
and uh, that means we're supposed to keep them for all time. Well, if that were the approach, why would people want this Constitution? Why would they want a Constitution today that did things like that? So I would say, if we're going to go back to yesterday's talk, there are at least some reasons for saying originalism is not the approach to follow. Now, unfortunately, you haven't heard the defense of originalism, and I'm not going to bother to defend it today. But there is something to be said for it, and that is those who advocate it say at least it's definite. At least it stops the judge from running wild with his own views of what's good. Now, I don't really think that's so, but that's the line, to me, that's been the strongest line of defense. Well, if you're not going to have originalism, then what's the judge supposed to do? How is he supposed to decide these cases in general? And I'll tell you what most people think, and probably in the corner of your mind, there's a little bit of this too. And I probably reinforced it a little bit with what I said yesterday. Well, I'll tell you who these judges are in Washington in that building. They're junior league politicians. They ought to look to politics. And my goodness, I can tell you how many times that I've seen people say to me, oh, I love your decisions, and I have a feeling they might think politically that they're on the same side. Maybe we are, and maybe we're not. Uh, or I can't bear those decisions. And they're thinking, well, politically, I don't agree. Because really what the Supreme Court is, is nine politicians who are not that good at being politicians. <laughs> Otherwise, they'd have been elected to something, and they never would have been there. But nonetheless, that's what they tried. Well, that can't be right. That can't be right despite everything I said yesterday. Because if what you're supposed to do is stick up your finger to the political winds, well, then why have a Supreme Court? Then Hamilton was basically wrong in putting this power of review in a court. If he wanted a politician, let's get some. Give the power to Congress. But it can't be right that the judges should sit there and test out the political wind. Well, if it's not going to be the political wind, and if it's not going to be a definite thing like originalism, what is it? Well, maybe it's just doing what you think is good. That's where I started, after all. And I said that won't work. And by the way, 10 minutes has passed, or seven anyway. And I still don't think it'll work. Because if you get nine people up there, and they're all trying to do whatever they think is good, in a particular instance, you will discover they disagree all the time. And indeed, different people think different things are particularly good. And certainly, over time, you won't get very much coherence. But that's what people think. They think either they're up there deciding what they think is good, or they're acting like junior league politicians and not telling us the truth about what that. Or we better have a definite theory, like originalism. And originalism isn't perfect, but it'll at least hold them in check. Now, now do I have a better defense of originalism? See, and that's what's going on, I think, in the minds of people who want to hold that particular point of view. But as I said, I don't think it works. So is there another different point of view an approach. Well, obviously, I think there is, or I wouldn't give this lecture. <laughs> but uh, what? What? And now we're back to where I started. And I'm back to what I called pragmatism, or a certain kind of pragmatic approach. And I found some fairly good historical support for this. Uh, Gordon Wood, in a very good recent book, traces back to 1798 the following thought a judge called Root from Connecticut. He said, what American judges do, and this is 1798, said, what American judges do when they're interpreting the law and trying to get a sensible interpretation is they look to quote the reasonableness and utility of the operation of those principles of law. That's not bad. I like that. It has immediate resonance for me. And moreover, I think, over time, 
We've seen judges trying to do that, and we read what Frankfurter tried to describe he was doing, or we read that Learned Hand thought, uh, compared uh, uh, interpreting a statute to interpreting a musical score to, to try to get at what was the root of this. There are lots of things that were written, probably more when I was in law school than even today, uh, that suggest a certain pragmatic, utilitarian, reasonableness approach in American law. And it's that approach uh, that I'm trying to describe. Well, what is it? Well, it puts a lot of weight on purposes and consequences. Uh, it um, looks to the basic values that underlie constitutional provisions. It looks to, I think, the fact that when they wrote the document, the framers created several institutions of government and they expected that those different institutions of government, while balancing each other to some degree, would work together in order to produce a government as a whole that worked well for Americans. Well, well we're making a little advance, not too much. Will this put judges out of control if they try to work on some kind of pragmatic basis? Will they suddenly and secretly substitute their own desires? There are lots of checks. There are lots of checks on judges. Not the least of which is that they have to write an opinion. And the opinion, if it's a good opinion, has to explain the true reasons why they reached the decision. The decision has to be reasoned. It has to be principled. It has to be transparent. It has to be informative. And in doing that, it has to follow or explain why not what I'd call a whole, maybe thousands, at least hundreds, of prescriptions of the legal craft. You learn that in law school. And then you put those together, and I think you have some content to what Learned Hand answered when he was asked these questions. Ronnie Dworkin says that. I don't know who asked him. Maybe Ronnie asked him. But uh, what is it that keeps you in check? Those books, he said those books. And he meant a lot more than precedent. He meant some of the things I've just mentioned in general terms. And then, too, judges create what Sandra O'Connor called footsteps. I first get to the court. I decide some cases. I create approaches out of the fact that I've decided those cases. And I don't like very much to deviate from an approach I first took. Why not? Well, because if I can deviate too much from an approach I first took, well, then there's no control over anything. <laughs> then it really is up to me subjectively, though I feel it's never up to me subjectively. I'm following law. All right, well, so far, what I've done is um, I've described, and I'm trying very generally to describe, in abstract terms, in a lot of words, things that are getting you to think about a particular approach. And sometimes I analogize that, the arguments among judges, to a kind of moral argument. What do we do when we have a moral argument with somebody? What do we do when we have an argument about some, with someone about what the right thing to do next? The right thing to do is to take him to the movies. I can't stand him. Do I have to take him to the movies? Well, think of all he did for you. All right, so now we're arguing about this. And uh, uh, is it right or is it wrong? And what we do is we refer to principles. And then we refer to facts. And then we refer to consequences. And then we're back at principles. And the argument gets all mixed up between principles, between facts, between predictions about what will happen, about what we did before. And if you start thinking about that, it's pretty similar to the kinds of arguments that go on in court. Oh, dear. This is all so complicated. Can I try to make it simpler? All right, let me try to do this. And let me take 15 or 20 minutes maybe a little longer, giving you some examples of what I mean. Because up there at the top level, I think of the words principles that don't change applying to circumstances that do. And I think of the words a set of institutions, not one, that's supposed to cooperate with each other to try to produce results that the government as a whole will work well for people. And then I think, but you can't decide cases bit by bit. And then I've learned over time, at least it seems to me, 
that there are sets of attitudes that judges can take in respect to particular kinds of cases that don't guarantee wonderful results in any, every, any, any particular case, but over time help produce better results because over time they help the court work better with some other institution. Now, I'll give you an example. In fact, I'll give you eight or nine examples of different, but I'm only going to really talk about two in depth, that will give you an ex examples of what I mean by attitudes, not theories, that help guide judges towards decisions that work better as a whole. Other institutions being relevant. Well, what is most of our work? Most of our work in the Supreme Court actually deals with Congress. We have lots of relationships with Congress. The normal relationship concerns statutes. And normally what we're doing is interpreting statutes. So if I say our relationship with Congress has to do with statutes, and the question before us is how do we interpret statutes, I would say the key pragmatic concept towards interpretation of statutes, pretty well known, is called the statute's purpose. What does that mean? Well, all judges, whenever they interpret a statute, have the same basic tools. They read the language. They look at the history. They look at tradition. If it's a word like res ipsa loquitur or something, you don't know what that means. You look up the tradition. Uh, you look at precedent. You look at the purpose of the statute. And you look at the consequences. The consequences judged in terms of the purpose. And that's what helps you find an interpretation. And what I'd say here is emphasize those latter two, purposes and consequences, particularly in the Supreme Court, because the others will help you a lot less. Now, what's a typical statutory problem so we can make this more concrete? I found a good example in a newspaper abroad. It turns out, apparently, there was a man who was going from Normandy. He was a school teacher, and he was going from Normandy to uh, Paris, and he taught biology. And he had a basket, and he had two dozen live snails in the basket. Right. The conductor came up, said, open the basket, please. Saw the snails, and said, you have to pay half fare for the snails. <laughs> he said, what do you mean you have to pay half fare for the snails? He said, well, read the tariff. The tariff here says, no pets. No animals, sorry, no animals allowed on the train except in a basket. And if they're in a basket, they have to pay half fare. He said, I have to pay. Snails? Snails have to pay half fare? Well, now, it's a little puzzling, isn't it? Do they have to pay half fare or don't they? I don't know. And by the way, why just one half fare? There were 20. <laughs> I mean, you see? Now, there is the kind of question we're likely to get in the Supreme Court of the United States. Right. Now, maybe not in that as exact words, but we have to figure that one out. And you try figuring it out by looking at the history without understanding, oh, all right, go on to a different example. Um, here's a real one. You can sue the government if they take your property wrongly, and, uh, or if they hurt you. It's called the Tort Claims Act. Now, there's an exception. And the exception is if the person who takes that properly wrongfully is any, quote, any officer of customs or excise or any other law enforcement officer. Hmm. Any other law enforcement officer. Does that mean a prison official? Does it mean a policeman on the corner? Or does it mean those other law enforcement officers that have something to do with customs and excise? Hmm, not such an easy question. Well, how are we going to find out the answer? Should we look in the dictionary? Well, which word didn't you know the meaning of? Is it you didn't know the meaning of any, or other, or law, or enforcement, or officer? Which word will the dictionary help you with? I don't think it will help. Or let's do this. Let's say, how are these words used in ordinary life? Well, I don't know. I mean, what part of ordinary life? I mean, in a movie? What's the title? I mean, when I go down the street, what? Again, I don't think I'm helped very much. 
Well, let's look at them very hard. <laughs> let's look at them two or three times, sound them to the ear. Is that going to help? You see, I'm very skeptical. Now I have an idea. There is a human being who wrote those words. Maybe if we can find out who that human being is and what that human being had in mind, we can answer the question. And lo and behold, who it turned out to be was a man called Holtzoff, who wrote a famous treatise, Baron and Holtzoff. And he was sitting in the Justice Department, and he actually kept notes and wrote a letter to Congress of how he found those words. And he was copying an English statute at the time. And when you looked at the English statute, it was absolutely clear that that English statute applied to customs policemen. And it did not apply to prison officials or anybody else. At least I thought it was pretty clear. And at least whoever joined my dissent thought it was pretty clear. <laughs> But there we are, okay? So why will I do this? Why, why? I've shown you the other doesn't work too well, but the purpose doesn't always work too well either. Why do it? Why try so hard? And I have said this, I'll look anywhere. I want it, somebody wrote those words. Find that person, see what they had in mind. Why do I do that? Well, there's some reasons I think are pretty good. And one of the reasons is this. I know that the people who wrote these words in Congress were elected by somebody. And those who elect them don't have a clue about this kind of thing. They're electors, they're voters, but they do have a sort of clue about what kind of country they want. And they have general objectives. And the congressman or senator who flies in the face of the general objectives that his constituents want is gonna find himself out of a job pretty quickly. So the good politicians, who actually get themselves elected, do have a pretty keen sense of what the general objectives are that members of their constituencies or majorities hold. Now, if those constituencies elect somebody to do something, and then he participates in the writing of a statute that has a particular objective, then let the court try to interpret that statute in a way that carries out, that does not fly in the face of, that does not wreck this individual congressman's effort to achieve that general objective through this statute. Now the reason in part is democratic theory, but the reason in part is very practical. Because if this statute doesn't work out, if this statute wrecks the general objective that that voter wanted, let's be sure that that congressman or senator has to take the blame for it and can't say, oh, it was the court, you know, they wrecked it. They interpreted that word law enforcement officer, you four people who have real interest in this in my constituency. But, but uh, don't let him say it was the court that wrecked it. The court tries to carry out the purposes that are underlying this statute. Oh, well, there are other reasons too. I mean, really, I think one of the best ones is maybe Congress understands the problem that they're trying to deal with better than we do. Uh, that's their job, after all. And so let them try to pursue this objective that they have in this statute in a lot of different ways, and let us try to understand what the objective is and assume that what they're trying to do there is to further their own objective and not to wreck it. That helps. And now what I think helps, too, is it helps that Congress doesn't have to fill in every detail. They can't. Life is too uncertain. You can't write everything into a statute. Now, all you have to do in order to know that, which is not a new discovery, is read, which I found exactly the argument, in Montaigne, 1584. Great essay on experience. I thought of showing it to some of my colleagues. Here's what he says. He says, you know, he says, I'd rather live in a country with no laws at all than live in a country with too many laws, like France. He says, this is what happened. Justinian was furious with the judges. Now, does this sound familiar? Justinian was furious with the judges because they're always doing what they want rather than what he wants. So here's what he thinks of doing. He thinks of writing a code that's really complicated and has thousands, of, you know, it'll get into every situation and it'll say, do this here and do that there and do the other thing in the other place and now we've got them and the judges have to follow it. They can't just do what they want. And Montaigne says, didn't he know 
that every written word is simply one more subject of an argument among lawyers. And when you write all those words, you are not going to give the judges less power. You are going to give them more power. So that's why I don't want to live in France anymore. Too many laws, but wait. There is an intermediate solution. And that intermediate solution, says Montaigne, is have a few laws, a few principles, standards, objectives written into the statute, and let the judges then interpret those words so that the statutes, purposes, standards, etc., are carried out. Now, I have to admit that I'm putting a little bit of gloss on Montaigne. But if you read it, you'll see, I think, that that's his basic point. All right? Oh, wait, there are objections. There are objections to this approach. I'm not being fair to the objections, and I'm, gonna not, I'm not going to be fair to them, but why be fair? Uh, look. What do you mean, says the objector? You're saying members in Congress, Congress has a purpose? Congress doesn't have a purpose. Members of Congress, individuals might have purposes, but their purpose might be to vote for something as fast as possible so I can get to lunch. Their purpose might be I'm voting for this in order to wreck my opponent and wreck the whole bill. It's a poison pill amendment. Who knows what their purposes are? Oh. It isn't really true that only individuals have purposes. So I made a list of some things that have purposes that aren't individuals, and they're not animals either. They're not even snails. I mean, what? Corporations have purposes. Companies, partnerships, municipalities, states, nations, armies, bar associations, legislatures, basketball teams, football teams, and many others. Do we know how to speak English? Yes. Do we know how to ascribe purposes to such entities? Absolutely. Can we ascribe purposes to Congress? Yes, if we go to law school, read enough legislation, have good professors, of which you do here, of, of, of uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, courses, and have a little bit of experience. We then begin to learn how this all works, and there's nothing odd about saying, the basketball team did that in order to prevent the other team from having too much possession of the ball, even if not one of those five people did anything but operate mechanically and was thinking of the latest movie at the time. Of course we can say that. Oh, wait. It's too hard to figure out what the purposes are. It's very hard. We don't really know what Congress's purposes are. And the judge will just describe any purpose that he wants to some kind of statutory language. And they're right, it is sometimes hard, sometimes hard. But let me tell you a joke, and then you tell me why it's funny. <laughs> Here is the joke. There are three men in a balloon. They're lost. They descend. Just above the ground, they see a farmer. This is in Maine. It's an old Maine joke. One of them says to the farmer, where are we? The farmer answers, in a balloon. I didn't think it was that funny. But you see, why is that a joke? When you see why that's a joke, you'll see why, in fact, it often is not hard, rarely hard, to ascribe purposes to what other people do, or what corporations do, or what Congress does. When Joanna says to me, there's no butter. She doesn't mean there's no butter in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Washington, DC. She means there's no butter in the house. How do we know that? Because we speak English. Because we understand how to derive what people intend from the context. We use context every day of the week. We use context every time we open our mouths to understand other people. We listen, and we know English and we apply the words. And so why is it such an odd thing, or such a difficult thing, in case after case, to do the same thing with statutes? Now, you see? Uh, oh, it's all to uh, the legislative history. That's another good one. The legislative history, which I look to. The reports, the reports, the floor statements, all those things. I said, Holtzoff was his first name, Baron Holtzoff, or was there another person called Baron? I forget that. But in, hmm? Alex Holtzoff. He was in his office in the Justice Department. I read his letter. 
Maybe he was writing the letter to confuse me. Maybe an assistant was writing the letter and didn't get it right but was pushing his own agenda. Maybe somebody in the congressional staff was doing it uh, in order to mix everybody up. Doesn't this give too much power to the staff, not the member of Congress? Well, I worked on the staff, you know, so I have a biased view on that one. And I think that the staffs are pretty great people as far as I can tell. Uh, and I do know this, I worked for Senator Kennedy for quite a long time. And if I tried to substitute my agenda for his, I'd be out of a job pretty fast. And, and I know the way that we used to uh, decide uh, what to write in reports. Drafts of reports were circulated. They're circulated to every member of Congress on the committee, and the committee has staff that reads the report. And the job of the staff person is to see if that report is basically consistent with what his boss thinks. And if he thinks that it isn't consistent, he'll point it out. And if he thinks it's something important, he'll tell the boss, so you better get back into this and see what's going on here. But that's why he's hired. That's how staffs work. That's how staffs work in Congress. That's how they work in General Motors. That's how they work in businesses. That's how they work even in universities, uh, though uh, the professor's pretty autonomous in the university. But nonetheless, uh, there are all kinds of institutions with staffs. And the, the senator is responsible for the staff. So what is, I say, what is the big problem? Now, you see, I'm giving you a sketch. But the sketch is, that purpose is going to help. Why is it going to help? It's going to help because it's going to help make that representative democratically responsible to his electorate. And that's a good thing and a good way to get things done in a democracy. And it's going to help because those staffs, when they write bills, are not going to have to think of every possible thing in advance. They're going to be able to use a few general words, and they're going to be able to explain what they're driving at, if necessary, in a report. Right. There we are. And yet we have a case. And the case was that a person, a person who has a child, who is handicapped can get a pretty good education for that child. It's called all education for all the handicapped. Great act, very good. Uh, sometimes the school board makes what could be a mistake and doesn't give that person, that child, the education to which they're entitled, in which case the parent can go and hire a lawyer and some experts and now sue the school board. And now what happens if the parent wins? Well, the child will get the better education but the parent's out an awful lot of money. Well, the statute says the parent can recover reasonable attorney's fees. Good. She can pay the attorney. But what about the expert? The expert in this case is, is all important, and the expert costs 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars. It's quite a lot of work. Now, it happens the statute just says including reasonable attorney's fees. Costs including reasonable attorney's fees. Does that include the expert too? Hmm. Well, let's look at the report. The report addresses the point. The report of whom? The report of the conference committee between the Senate and House that ended up with the final language and they said, we mean to include experts. And then the bill went back for a vote and everybody has the, I'm not saying they all read the conference report, but that was on the agenda and they're supposed to vote on it and they voted on it and they adopted that report which had that language, which is the way you adopt language uh, of the, the compromise in the Senate. And they did that unanimously, nobody objected. I say, can we not read that? Can we not look at it? Does it not give us an idea of what we were thinking? OK, I thought it did. I thought we looked to the purpose. I thought we find the purpose wherever we want. And, uh, uh, and uh, those who agreed with me joined the dissent. OK, so there we are. Um, so you see what I'm trying to illustrate here. I'm trying to illustrate there is an approach. It doesn't answer every question, but there's an approach. It starts with a P and it ends with E. It's called purpose. And uh, that helps in an awful lot of cases. And not just deciding this, but deciding it in a way that advances the workability of the system. Now, I can go through a lot of other examples, but I won't in that depth. But I have divided it according to the kind of work we have in the relation to the institution. For example, a subject I like, which hardly anyone else does, is administrative law. I taught that for years. 
And administrative law really has to do with the relationship between the judges now and the executive branch, because most of what the executive branch does is administration. So the bulk of our work there is reviewing the work of that administrative branch to see what? To see if it conforms, well, uh, is it, does it conform to the statute? Does it conform to the regulations? Does it conform to a few common law principles? Did they apply proper procedure? Is the policy that they've developed reasonable or is it arbitrary capricious? Is it constitutional? There are a number of things that we review to see. Now, how do we do that? And here, I have a concept. And the concept developed out of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, when judges tried to develop a relationship, legally speaking, with the people in the administrative branch of government. And if I look back at that, I would say it consists of two words plus another, plus two others, the two words being uh, comparative expertise. Who is the better expert at this kind of question? You or the agency? So if it's a question of procedure, courts know quite a lot about procedure. If it's a question of the Constitution, they're supposed to know really quite a lot, comparatively speaking. If it's a question of the policy that the statute is trying to further, well, the agencies are usually experts in that, and so courts back away, steer a little bit away from that. Uh, if it's a question of the statute's meaning, well, you might think, well, corporations, hmm, sorry, courts are pretty expert at statutes. Isn't that their job? Well, try reading a few of those statutes. Try reading thousands and thousands of words there, and you'll see an awful lot of statutes that really no one can understand too well except for the agency that happens to work with them every day. And a lot of those words govern very minor matters within the agency. And so there has been developed a view, which we hold at the court, that even on certain statutory matters, Give the agency the benefit of the doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt when they interpret the statute. EPA wants to have what used to be called a bubble. A bubble. The bubble was we're not going to regulate the smoke coming out of any stack. We're going to pretend there's a bubble over the factory and choose your own stack, but the total amount within the bubble has to stay constant. Do they have the power to do that? Well, says our court, it's a question of what the statute says, but they know the statute here better than we do. And uh, Congress meant to give them a bit of power to interpret that statute as they wish. You see, they know more about it. We give it to them, but wait, we better look at the statute. So in any case, what I'm saying there is it's not just comparative expertise. It's comparative expertise viewed in light of the particular statute and what was its purpose. So if you have a statute that says, for example, EPA, you in fact have to, you don't have to, but you have the power to, you have the power to make rules concerning What's the word? Air pollutants. Does that include carbon dioxide? Well, on the one hand, they know a lot more about carbon dioxide than we do. On the other hand, that's an awfully big question. It's a pretty major question under this statute. So in any case, our court, seeing that word in the statute and seeing the question, begins to think, is this the kind of question that Congress would have wanted the agency to have a leg up in deciding? And on that one, we said no. On the bubble, we said yes. Hmm, what's going on? Well, what I think is going on is this, that we live in a world where the technicality is unbelievable. There is chemistry, there are pollutants, there is everything is related to everything else and everything is incredibly complicated and we need expert agencies, we need people there to regulate things and they're always going to know a lot more than judges about their own particular subject matter but they have a particular problem which is they tend to think whatever they're doing like all human beings think is the most important thing in the world and therefore they can get carried away. So judges keep them under control. Agencies, go do your job. But what's the right attitude? in particular cases that the judge should take to the agency. How much leeway should he give him? Well, there's a problem here. If you give the agencies too much leeway to do things, goodbye democracy. You'll have us run by the bureaucrats. But if you give them too little leeway, you will discover you can't get anything done. 
because when you tell them exactly what to do, direct, you regulate SO2X or whatever it is up to such and such a degree, you may discover that's the wrong, exactly the wrong thing to tell them. We don't tell the Army what hills to take in, in, in legislation, and so you have to give the agency leeway, and to make a long story short, who decides how much leeway they get? Congress. And where does it say it? In the statute. And what words does it use? Who knows? It never focuses on the question. But the question the judge will ask is, looking at this statute and considering the comparative expertise of the agencies to answer this question, the question arising under this statute, let's give the agency the degree of leeway that Congress likely would have intended given its purpose, and then decide what's necessary to hold them in check. Now, that's complicated, but it creates a relationship. It creates a relationship between court, agency, and Congress. And that relationship has as its objective allowing better functioning of a complex administrative system in the democracy that has to be ultimately responsible to the people. Now, I'm not going to convince you of that in two minutes. And indeed, that is the most difficult, most boring part of this entire book. But I wanted to mention it so we get through the worst part first. <laughs> now, what about federalism? Again, I think there are interesting, simple concepts. I'm just giving you a summary of what I've written. What concept? Why do we have federalism? What is federalism? And I think there are probably, if you look through the cases and look at the history, the things that made the most impression upon me, one of them was what Madison said. Madison said, you know, there's a difference between Europe and the United States. In Europe, it's power that creates liberty. In the United States, it's liberty that creates power. And what he meant by that is that in Europe at that time, it was the king, you see, where the power was, at the center. And they might, if they had a liberal king or if they had uh, some kind of central government that wanted free people, allow freedom to the people. That's the opposite of the American idea. The American idea was that power rested in the people. A free people, that's what he has in mind by liberty. And it's that liberty that delegates to the center, namely, federal, uh, namely the federal government, the authority that it has to do things. The residual part rests in the people. Now, that's the theory of it. The practical part is that very often uh, people in a lot of practical ideas, people who are in small towns and cities or large towns, they know more about their mayor or the fire department or the police department than people in Washington. Or at least they can hold them more directly responsible. Or there's a classical idea that Brandeis said that if you add a lot of states, put them together, uh, they can experiment with a lot of different ways. There are a number of practical ideas here. And what does it tell us about the court? Well, when I put them together, I see a word that they use in Europe, which we don't use here very much, but it's a pretty good word, and it's called subsidiarity, and it says that, uh, in fact, power will, uh, should be given at whatever level is the lowest level that can exercise it effectively. Don't put it at a more central place than you have to. That's great advice. From the judge's point of view, they have no idea how to apply it. Why? Because we're applying it in a world where, every, where everything is related to everything else. Follow that through, and you'll see some consequences. The consequences, from my point of view, is it has to be very, very, very rare that we will overturn a congressional judgment to take power and to pass legislation. Because everything affects everything, they're more likely to know than we. It also suggests when we're trying to do an undoubtedly federal function, protect the federal marketplace, we have to be a little more active. And in that area, courts and Congress and other agencies look for ways of cooperating, and uh, I don't think I'll go into them, but there are ways. And then this idea of subsidiarity, if you like, or federalism, plays a role in a lot of cases where it might not seem to play a role. For example, one case I felt pretty strongly about was a case involving efforts by Seattle and by Louisville to apply affirmative action plans. 
well, affirmative action plans. The court said they couldn't do it. I wrote partly in my dissent, but my goodness, no one knows here what's going to work. There are problems. There are undoubtedly problems. And why is it a bad idea to let, at least in limited ways, different communities experiment with different ways of dealing with these problems, including affirmative action? Well, that's a federalism idea. That's a subsidiarity idea. And you can look through cases in the court and you'll see this subsidiary idea, this subsidiarity idea affecting quite a lot of cases. What about the relationship to other federal courts? There, I think, that what's at stake is not other federal courts, lower courts, uh, what people see, they see trial courts, appeals courts, the Supreme Court, and they think it's a hierarchy. So that's a misleading concept. A better concept, a very practical concept, is to think of the word specialization and to think that people at different levels have different jobs. And if you think of the people at different levels having different jobs, then you ask the question, well, what's the Supreme Court's job? I say, the Supreme Court's job, basically? Basically, it's to resolve legal questions where the lower courts have come to different conclusions on matters of federal law, because we need a uniform federal law. And the Supreme Court doesn't do that too badly. But if you ask the Supreme Court to start second guessing every court of appeals in the country, or if you ask them to start looking at things that the trial courts are particularly good at, like managing, uh, uh, managing uh, uh, litigation, uh, deciding what kind of discovery is appropriate, deciding things about individual witnesses, and if you ask the Supreme Court to start reading records and coming to a conclusion out of reading a record, you're going to have a pretty hard time uh, because the court isn't very good at reading records because there are nine of us and you might get nine different opinions and you might not have time for everybody really to go into each record with the depth that it deserves. Therefore, I'd say, look, specialization, leave reading records to the trial courts, uh, not to the Supreme Court. Let the Supreme Court primarily focus on deciding legal issues. But anyway, the word that I think works there is called specialization. What about the court's relationship with prior courts? Prior courts, prior Supreme Courts. The word that describes that relationship is called stare decisis. That has to do with overturning prior precedent. How do we go about that? Now, there, I think if you want a concept, the concept has to be something to do with stability. And it has to have something to do with pragmatism because you can't find a general rule that applies every, to every case. You can't even easily find a set of principles that tells you when to overturn cases and when not. For example, Brown versus Board overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson said separate but equal. Brown v. Board, after 80 years, figured out that that was a mistake. And I think there are very few people alive now who think it was wrong. I mean, it was ripe for overturning and should have been overturned. But you can get carried away with this overturning things. And why might a judge in our court get carried away with overturning things? One reason is because judges on our court stay there a long time. And they are appointed by different presidents. And different presidents have different points of view. And a president who tries to appoint a Supreme Court justice whom he thinks will decide his way on all kinds of cases is in for a rude surprise. When Theodore Roosevelt appointed Oliver Wendell Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes within months decided the way Roosevelt thought was completely wrong in Northern Securities and Antitrust case. And Roosevelt said, I could, uh, I could carve a judge with more backbone out of a banana. All right, he was annoyed. And Holmes never understood why Roosevelt stopped inviting him to parties at the White House. It was absolutely true. Ah, but if you think a president might try to appoint someone who shares a kind of very basic, very abstract outlook about how the country works, about how the law works, about the relation of law to individuals or to the country, presidents tend to have more success at that. And therefore, if people are there for a long time, you'll get people with pretty different general, abstract, philosophical points of view. And now what will happen? 
each of those people will think that he's right. I mean, why was he appointed to the Supreme Court if he isn't right? I mean, he's right. And there's a lot of precedent out there that's wrong. And we've got to get back to the true Constitution. So, thinks each of different views. I'm right. We better get back to the true Constitution, which all this precedent's got mixed up, because it was decided by people of different views, and probably for other reasons. They may have just been mistaken. And in addition, a point that you don't realize until you're there for a while, you're not going to get another chance. An issue comes up, and it's very easy in a court of appeals to think, oh, it'll come back, it'll come back. Don't worry if you get this wrong, it'll come back. It won't come back. It won't come back in the Supreme Court. So here we have this right in front of us, a very important matter. And my goodness, it was wrongly decided before. And my goodness, I understand the Constitution. Indeed, I've just been appointed, and I better make it right now. If I don't make it right now, I'll never have another chance. You see the psychology? I'm not saying everyone has that psychology, but there's an institutional push in that direction. And the problem is, Resist it. Resist it. And how can you resist it? Because you're not going to resist it all the time. And the answer is to focus your mind on the need for stability in a legal system. And that need for stability is great. It has many parts to it. You can't go around every day of the week and start overturning things you think were wrong, or there won't be much of a legal system left and people won't be able to live underneath it. And therefore, resist. How far? How far should you resist? Well, far enough. I mean, what's the answer to that? I can't tell you. It's a pragmatic thing that people have to work out for themselves. But uh, if you go too far, you're going to wreck the system. And if you don't go far enough, you're going to end up with Plessy v. Ferguson. You see? I can outline the problem, and I can tell you the approach, and I can't always get you to the answer. It's hard enough to get to the answer. All right, so what have we been through? You've seen the statutory part and purpose. You've seen the administrative law, at least got a glimpse of it. You've seen the federalism idea. You've seen treating other courts as a specialization and not real hierarchy. You've seen the prior court is treated in terms of what? Uh, stability, but with a pragmatic cast of mind to it. And then there are an awful lot of cases that involve not just other institutions, but involve all institutions. And all institutions are under an obligation uh, to follow certain basic uh, protections that we have for individual rights. And there, I think, too, there's an approach. It's not a guarantee. It's an approach that looks to the value that underlies the particular provision of the Constitution and tries to apply that value to modern circumstance. And an awful lot of these provisions, an awful lot of them, require a degree of balancing. Because even the First Amendment, sacred though it is, can not be enough to protect against a law, for example, where that law stops somebody from killing somebody, uh, where consider espionage laws, uh, consider a lot of laws, where are you regulate what people can say because the consequence of not doing so is viewed as too terrible. Well, how do we know which are which? How do we know what to do when privacy and First Amendment uh, values conflict, etc.? Again, there's an approach. The one I think I like to call it, I like to call it proportionality. And there's a whole system. I wrote about it, unfortunately, in a dissent in the gun control case. But uh, there we are. There are approaches. And now, let me now describe one last one at greater length because it's less technical, it may have more interest, and it's harder to figure out what to do. What about the relation of the court to the president himself? Where does that come up legally? It comes up in areas where the president has enormous power as president, not just as administrator. And the place where it comes up recently that I think has been of the greatest interest is, of course, in the area of national security. Because the president's power is great in the area of national security. And there, the notion, the approach, the idea that I think a pragmatic court is trying to carry out is called this. It's called keep the president accountable. But wait, not too much. He does have to protect the nation. 
So I sort of think of it, and it was in the Guantanamo cases, as a kind of accountability tug on a string. Now let me tell you about two cases, or two sets of cases, and you'll see what I mean about the difficulty here. The first is 1946, was it? 44, 44, Korematsu. How did the court get into this mess? Korematsu is a case where 70,000 American citizens were taken without a trial, without any real procedure, and put in camps for the duration of the war. They were Japanese. I mean, they were of Japanese ancestry, but they were American citizens. And that case has always stood as sort of a blot. So what happened in that case? How did we get in to that mess? Well, this is basically what happened. 1942, I was alive then. I was in San Francisco. I can remember the blackout curtains that my parents would draw every evening. The Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. And people in California were frightened. And they thought there might be an invasion. And indeed, that was a reasonable thing to think. Maybe there would be an invasion of California. Certainly people thought that in December of 41 and the beginning of 1942. And people began to write, but there are thousands, 100,000 potential fifth columnists right here in California. Who are they? They're the Japanese, I mean, those of Japanese ancestry. And we can't have them here when the Japanese are approaching with their aircraft carriers and submarines. And who was saying that? The LA Times? Walter Lippmann? Earl Warren? Hmm. Earl Warren, I have to say, later said it was the worst thing he'd ever done in his life. But it took him some time to figure that out. Because at the time, he made the argument to a group, I think, it included a lot of fruit and vegetable growers who did have a certain self-interest because many of the Japanese also grew fruit and vegetables and uh, they would soon be removed and that might help them economically, but nonetheless, let's keep that out of it, which I've just put in it. But uh, Warren said the very fact, and a lot of people made this argument, the very fact there has been no instance of sabotage so far is the proof that they must be planning something. <laughs> now that argument, oddly enough, had a lot of resonance at the time. The person in charge of California was General DeWitt. He was in the Presidio of San Francisco. And he wrote a report. And in his report, he said he thought there were instances in which unidentified signals, probably from the Japanese on shore, had been going out to submarines. And he thought there were instances of sabotage, where, in fact, Japanese on Japanese ancestry, when I say that, on the shore, had played a role. And therefore, the thing to do was to remove the Japanese from California and send them east, to the east of California, or to the basin. And where should we keep them? We'll build camps. Hmm. That was his recommendation. It was debated in Washington for a while. But one of the strongest opponents, interestingly enough, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI. He said, there's no need for this. We have this problem well under control. But ultimately, the Secretary of War and the Attorney General, Biddle, Harry Stimson, at the advice of John J. McCloy, thought this was a very reasonable idea. And Roosevelt signed the order, and they were removed. They were ordered. First, there was a curfew, which went on for a few weeks. And then there was a, uh, uh, an order saying, you cannot leave California. And the way it took form was, you can't leave California if you're of Japanese ancestry. Next order, you can't stay in California. What, we can't leave and we can't stay? Oh, wait, there are a few places here that you can stay. One is Tan Fran Racetrack. Another is Santa Anita. And they were put in those places. And once they were there, they were put in trucks and trains, and they're brought to camps further east. Now, that happened. I can remember my mother driving me down by Tan Fran Racetrack and saying that's where they put the Japanese in the war. And her approval was not in her tone of voice. But uh, they went. And there were very few people, very few, including the Japanese themselves, who really complained about it too much. They didn't want to cause a lot of fuss. 
Now, suddenly, a few decided to bring a test case. There was Hirabayashi, there was Korematsu, there was Mizendo. Now, Hirabayashi, completely loyal American, uh, lived up in, I think it was Washington, state of Washington. And he said, walked himself into the FBI, and he says, I'm not going to obey the curfew, and I'm not reporting. And they then charged him with a crime under this statute. There was a trial, and he was convicted. And the judge said, I'm going to sentence you uh, to 30 days on each. And he made a little mistake here, his lawyer. And he said, you know, that he was going to make it two consecutive 30-day terms. And he said, no, if it's two 30-day terms, I have to, I'd rather have a longer term, because the shorter term means I have to stay in the county jail, and the longer term means I can be on a work camp. And so he said, OK, I'll make it one 60-day term on each, and they'll run concurrently. All right, so he goes to the work camp. Korematsu in San Francisco, he comes in and says, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to report. I'm sure you can't just put me in a camp because I'm a, ja I'm a citizen. I'm an American citizen. I was born in Oakland. I went to City College of Los Angeles. I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, he found a lawyer. The lawyer was Ernie Bezig, who by chance used to play poker with my father. <laughs> but uh, and Ernie Bezig was the, uh, was the uh, uh, Civil Liberties Union lawyer in San Francisco. And the ACLU, for a variety of internal reasons, uh, wouldn't let him represent the ACLU in that case. And uh, he couldn't. He had to put his own name on the brief. But anyway, he brought the case. And eventually, these cases, first Hirabayashi finds its way to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court said is, well, it's a curfew. See, it's a curfew. It took place just after this uh, bombing. There might have been good reason for it. And then it quotes DeWitt's report you know, about the sabotage and the radio signals and so forth. And we cannot say it's beyond the war powers, even though it's racially oriented. Hirabayashi is convicted. What about going to the camp? Well, said the court, the sentence is concurrent, so we don't have to reach that issue. Hmm. That's right. A year later, it's now 1944, Korematsu's case reaches the Supreme Court of the United States. Hmm. Court says, you were sent to the camp, yes. He objects to that, yes. Well, we already decided this in Hirabayashi. Black writes the opinion. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting about that case, which I learned as I read about it. By 1944, it was pretty apparent that the reasons that had been given in 1942 were, to put it mildly, pretty good rubbish. Here's why we think that. There were two lawyers in the Department of Justice, Ennis and Burling were their names, and they were really outraged by what DeWitt kept writing, which had a strong racial overtone. I mean, really racial. And even the Department of Defense was getting fed up with DeWitt, and they transferred him to a different place. But his reports were still out there. So Ennis and Burling take the reports, and they read them. And they said, well, the, these say that, the, uh, uh, that there were broadcasts going from the Japanese to submarines offshore. Hmm, how does he know that? Let's give it to the FCC. And this says, sabotage. Well, let's ask the FBI. Two weeks later, the FCC comes in with a report like that. And what does it say? He says, there were no instances, none, zero, not one broadcast. He said, well, why did they think that? He said, well, because uh, th there were some young uh, uh, privates just got into the Army, and they didn't know how to work our equipment. And we've tracked every single one. They said, well, how did you do this in just two weeks? We didn't do it in two weeks. We did it in December of 1941 and January of 1942, and we gave that to DeWitt, and he knew it at the time. Same thing with the sabotage. It came back that J. Edgar Hoover knew these instances. Some of them took place after the camps, everybody's in the camps. They were not involving the Japanese, and Hoover was saying, we said to DeWitt at the time, we have this under control, there are a thousand people we'd like to arrest, but not 70,000. 
please, this is ridiculous. And we told him that at the time. Now, these two lawyers had a problem. I mean, they're officers of the court. And what they did was they said, we want to write a footnote in here. And the footnote is going to say to the court, don't take judicial notice of anything in DeWitt's final report. It said, a recital of the circumstances justifying the evacuation as a matter of military necessity is in several respects, particularly with reference to the use of illegal radio transmitters and shore to ship signaling by persons of Japanese ancestry in conflict with information in the possession of the Department of Justice. He wrote that in the brief. At this point, the Defense Department had an absolute fit. And who was called in to mediate this dispute? The person who was the Attorney General in the Department of Justice in charge of war, Herbert J. Wexler. And Herbert J. Wexler ended up mediating this fight. So what appeared in the brief was the following. We have specifically recited in this brief the facts relating to the justification for the evacuation of which we ask the court to take judicial notice and re rely upon the final report only to the extent it relates to such facts. That's a little more obscure. But in that brief, he wrote this, in the oral argument, the ACLU did a pretty good job. And they got Charlie Horsky. And Charlie Horsky, in the oral argument, holds this brief up and reads them the footnote and says, I'm telling you what this means. This means that what DeWitt said is a bunch of rubbish, and they will not stand behind it. And the court had a pretty good idea. And then the, there were some Japanese-American uh, associations. You know, by this time, the Nisi were fighting in Europe, and they were the most decorated ever, and they'd come back to their homes, and the home wouldn't be there, and they'd go out to see the, 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 the lieutenant. And I probably some of you saw this in the films. They went out to the camp where their parents are, and, and there was barbed wire around it, and the camp commander is pretty sympathetic, and they say, how can you keep my parents in this place where I'm out there risking my life for this country? And the commander said, well, that's the United States Army for you. you know, I mean, but, I mean that's, it was uh, gone, the, the feeling in the United States that this should be going on. And the court is told in the briefs, bit by bit, that there is no justification. But the court upheld it, and it upheld it of three dissents. Now, why did it uphold it? That's what I think is so interesting. And I think the answer is found in the dissents. So what Jackson says in the dissent, his dissent is this, he's famous for this. He says, you can't uphold this. The war is over. There's no need. This is 1944. It isn't 1942. And he says, the military, let them do what they want. If it were 1942, they're going to do it. We can't control that. But it's our job to, after the military does what it thinks is necessary, to come in and say it's unlawful. And that's what we should do here. That's what I'd call super pragmatism. <laughs> I don't like that super pragmatic approach. Why don't I like it? Because for one thing, it's telegraphing to the military that sometimes they may have to take steps that are outside the law. And if that's true, I certainly don't want a judge saying that. I mean, they face this problem in Israel, and they think it's a thoroughly bad idea to say to the military, you may have to take steps to save the country that are outside the law. And at the same time, if the military really needs to do something, maybe they wouldn't do it, because they won't want it to be turned aside later. The President of the United States pays a big political price, if he ever was willing to pay it, for doing something that the court is later going to say is unconstitutional. So this is a system that might not work too well. And at least in Israel, they've tried to make the law correspond to the military necessity so you don't get into a situation where you have to violate the law in order to save the country. Well, said Jackson. This opinion is going to stand here. He had great phrases. This opinion, which I'm descending from, is going to stand here like a loaded gun. The precedent is like a loaded gun, waiting for the next time. Well, in fact, it isn't like a loaded gun, because there isn't one person in the United States of America, I think, who thinks that Korematsu is a good precedent for anything. I mean, I'm not sure how much of a loaded gun it is. Then there's Murphy. And what Murphy does is Murphy goes through 
systematically and says there's no justification. There's no justification for this whatsoever. Problem? What about the next case? Frankfurter says, we can't review these one at a time. We can't review them. I mean, either Roosevelt runs the war or the judges run the war. We can't do it. You see the problem? They can't figure out, I think, how to bring this under control. So in Korematsu, it was an effort to get accountability. But the effort failed because the court couldn't figure out how to make them accountable. Right. Last five minutes. Let me compare briefly what the court, I think, has been trying to do with the Guantanamo cases. What? We've had four cases. In each of those cases, the detainee has brought a case, and really the detainee has won. Case number one, the detainee says, I'm entitled to file a writ of habeas corpus. The government says, no, you're not. The statute doesn't apply. The court says, well, you can file a writ of habeas corpus. Why? Because Guantanamo is part of the United States. Does this mean that anyone on a battlefield can file a writ of habeas corpus? No. The court doesn't say. It says, we're talking about Guantanamo. All we're saying is you can file a writ. We're not telling you whether you're going to win. We're not telling you what the conditions are under which you'd win. We're not going to say more than that. Case number two, Hamdi, an American citizen. He's being held, not in Guantanamo anymore, but in a naval brig. He says, hmm, can't hold me. Why not? Well, no power under the Constitution. The court says, we can hold, you can hold him if he's a, an enemy combatant. If he's an enemy combatant and there are active hostilities going on, as there were when he was captured in Afghanistan, you can hold him. He says, but I wasn't an active combatant. I was just a peaceful farmer. Well, says the army, why did you have a bazooka? Well, peaceful farmers need bazookas in Afghanistan. But, but the, 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 the point is there's a disagreement as to the facts. The court says, if there's a disagreement, you have to give him a fair hearing. What's a fair hearing? A fair hearing is a neutral decision maker, an opportunity to present proofs and argument. When do you have to give him this fair hearing? Won't you be more detailed than that? No. The court is not more detailed than that. Third case that comes up. They want to try the government Bin Laden's driver, named Hamdan, in a special military tribunal. A special tribunal, not a court-martial, not an ordinary court. Can you do it? Well, says the court, we're not going to tell you constitutionally, because we've looked at the statute, and the statute says that you can use a military commission only when another statute permits it, and we don't see one, or when you're considering a violation of the laws of war, and that isn't what you're trying him for. But we don't have to go further than that. Congress can pass another statute if it wants. We're not saying it would be constitutional. We're not saying they should. But this is a matter of what the statute says. Fourth case. Congress did get around to responding to the third case. And in the fourth case, it says, there are going to be military commissions. And it also says that what there will not be is review in the Supreme Court by habeas corpus. Hmm. Now the court has to reach a real problem. Because the Constitution says that Congress cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus except in time of insurrection or rebellion, which wasn't here. And have they violated that provision? The issue was pretty complicated because they provided for some other kinds of review. And the question was, was that equivalent to habeas corpus, which we thought it wasn't. But the key question was, does that constitution protect the people, assuring them a right of habeas corpus when they're in Guantanamo? And the court says yes. Now, 
the dissent. Well, then you're saying all over the world, you have an R war and somebody's gonna start filing for habeas corpus. No, the court said about that, didn't say yes, it didn't say no. It just said these matters are pragmatic matters. I didn't write that decision, but I thought it was a good decision. Justice Kennedy wrote it and I counted the number of times he used the word pragmatic and it was approximately 12, <laughs> at least. And whole phrases, whole phrases consisted of that idea. The judgment about where habeas corpus applies in time of war or national security is a pragmatic judgment. Now, what I'm trying to show you very briefly is a contrast. What the court was doing in that case, I think, was trying to keep a string, a string of accountability. Decide as little as you can because who knows what will happen by way of national security. The Supreme Court is not an expert on national security. And again and again, justices of the court have written to the effect that the Constitution is not a suicide pact. And we have a president whose job it is to assure that security. But, 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 what happens where the basic civil right that the court is there to protect is interfered with by this decision. The Korematsu court says, no choice. If it's the president or the court to run the war, it has to be the president. What you've seen happening, in my opinion, over the last few years is an effort to keep a string of accountability on the president, even in that time of war. Now, what have I tried to outline? I've tried to outline eight real approaches. What are they? Approaches. I've said that there are certain concepts that will help work. What are those concepts? In the area of statutes, it has to do with purpose. In the area of administrative law, it has to do with comparative expertise viewed in light of a statute. In the area of federalism, it has to do something with this notion of subsidiarity. When you start talking about lower courts and higher courts, the key word is specialization. When you start talking about the past and precedent, you talk about stability, and you talk about it in terms of a pragmatic judgment as to when you overrule. When you talk about dispositions, provisions in the Constitution that protect civil rights, the key word is values, and maybe proportionality if you have to do some balancing. And when you talk about the president as president, you remember the word accountability. But again, much pragmatic judgment and an effort at least to keep the president on a string while recognizing the need that could be real for a power in the president and the military to give the protection that's necessary. Now, I put all those things together and I don't say that those are the only ways you could approach problems, legal problems in our court. But I do say that they're coherent. They're consistent with each other. They do help in many areas produce decisions that help the government work a little bit better. And therefore I can say that at least looking back at my own decisions creates a kind of coherent role, whole grouped around the notion of trying to produce decisions that will in fact make the law work reasonably well, permanent values, changing circumstances, work reasonably well now. Who knows whether they've been successful? That will be for futures to decide. But it's at least an approach. And that's an approach that I think, if it works, and works fairly well, can help the court produce better decisions, if it produces better decisions in the sense that they work and they cooperate better with other, with other uh, agencies, with other parts of the government, uh, then we have a government that will, in fact, be workable. And if the government is workable, uh, the public is more likely to accept the court as an institution and follow it, even when it disagrees. So that's what I think of as the court's responsibility. One last word. I should just end right now but I can't, because then it will leave you the impression that I think I have a magic solution, and I don't have a magic solution. Nobody could think, nobody could think,
but the court doing a little bit of it my way or a little bit of it some other way is really going to make that much difference. Because what does make a difference, ultimately, to people accepting the court is their decision to make a, a kind of faith of the following, accepting an institution that they know will decide things that they don't like, at least some of the time. Now, that's very, very hard to get people to understand why that could be in their interest. So I think of the court as floating on a sea of public opinion. And that public opinion cannot, zero, cannot affect the decision of an individual case. But that public opinion of support has to be there for the institution to survive. And that's why I think the best we can do, though I'd love people to adopt the approach I have, is to say, well, there is an approach that may help some. But more important than that is what I said at the beginning of the lecture, which is so easy to say. And it sounds like a dull word, but it's called education. And it's called participate in the government. And it's called understand our institutions. And it's called the opposite of learning that civics is no longer being taught in a lot of high schools. And it's called the opposite of learning that more and more judicial campaigns are fought on the basis of who can contribute the most money, because you're not going to have an independent judiciary with that kind of system. And it's for the kind of participation and understanding that will, in fact, lead people to understand through experience what their government's about, this democracy. And it also suggests that you, law students or teachers, and even judges, can help at least a little bit by trying to explain to people what it is we do, what it is that judges do, what the law is about, and why they might even support following it, even when the decision goes against them.